So as you know, the topic for our webinar today will be the second edition revised and expanded design inference. And this is one of the first um, publications from Discovery Institute Press's new academic imprint, which is designed for books that have subtitles just like this, eliminating chance through small probabilities. Um, not recommended reading before your morning coffee, um, but definitely, I, I think, a surprising, um, surprisingly accessible book for, for being an academic publication. So hopefully many of you already have the book. If you don't, it is available on Amazon. Barnes and Noble and bookshop.org. So you can um, order it from either of those three places. Um, joining us today are the two co-authors of this book, um, Dr. Dembski and Dr. Ewart. Um, so let me just give a brief introduction to each of our authors and, and then we'll get started. So um, Dr. Dembski, uh, Bill, as many of you know him, is a noted mathematician and a philosopher who has degrees in psychology, philosophy, mathematics, theology, and he's got, I think, over 25 books now published uh, on topics like design, science and faith, information theory, and things like that. And most notably, the author of the original, The Design Inference from 1998, published by Cambridge University Press. Um, he's also the founding and senior fellow of Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture, as well as a distinguished fellow of the Bradley Center for Natural and Artificial Intelligence here at Discovery Institute. Um, so... To have commanded an hour of your time is a real privilege. Thank you for joining us, Bill. Good to be here. And then the uh, second author of this new title, Winston Ewart, um, is a software engineer as well as an intelligent design researcher with a PhD in electrical and computer engineering from Baylor University. And he also is a senior fellow of the Bradley Center uh, for Natural and Artificial Intelligence. And on a personal note, he is a new dad. And so it's equally exceptional to have somehow <laughs> Uh, carved out some of his precious time this evening. So thanks for joining us. It's good to be here. All right. And as for me, um, I serve as the Director of Education and Outreach for the Center for Science and Culture. I don't have any of the, the accolades I just mentioned for our co-authors. So my goal as the MC and moderator of this webinar is to be a sort of liaison to you to help um, help our brainiacs explain their research in a way that hopefully the rest of us can understand and appreciate. So at the beginning of the webinar, I'd like to just first spend a few minutes discussing the context and the motivation for this new book, um, just to cover some, some big questions that probably all of you have about the book. And then we'll launch into uh, audience Q&A for the rest of our time together. So at any time now, feel free to start dropping questions into the Q&A feature here in Zoom. Um, I'd recommend that you um, keep your questions as succinct as possible and try to limit to one or two questions because we have so many joining today that I'd like to get to as many of those as possible. Um, and you're welcome to submit them either anonymously or you can um, include your name so that we can reference that as we work through the questions. Um, and then if you have any technical difficulties, you can also submit those in the Q&A and John Felt, as I mentioned earlier, um, will be able to respond to those on the back end uh, directly. And um, yeah, so I'd like to just start with a few general questions. And Bill, I'll start with you as the lead author and as the author of the original edition. I would love to hear from you just a very brief history of this book, starting over 25 years ago with the original edition, and then explaining the, the motivation for this second edition. Right. Uh, so the, the beginnings of this book go back to my uh, the end of my graduate studies in mathematics at the University of Chicago. I was had some time on my hands after defending my dissertation. So I attended a conference at Ohio State University uh, convened by Percy Diaconis, a Stanford statistician and Harvey Friedman, a logician at Ohio State. And uh, it was a conference on randomness, interdisciplinary, number of uh, very high profile people there Amos Tversky, uh, uh, the great psychologist was there, statisticians, computer scientists, philosophers. But the conference, it was titled Randomness, and the idea was to come up with a theory of randomness. But it ended on a thud. Rather than say what randomness isn't, it uh, kind of reversed it. Uh, Percy Diaconis wrapping up the conference said, we know what randomness isn't, we don't know what it is. 
Well, that got me thinking because as a theist, it seemed to me that chance or randomness is not something that's fundamental. Uh, the reason he said we know what randomness is and we don't know what it is, is in uh, a lot of situations, you may see something that looks random, a random, what looks like a random ink blot, and then suddenly you see a pattern in it, like uh, a woman combing her hair or a skull or something. We've seen these sorts of illusions. And once we see the pattern, we don't unsee it. And so what I did was I turned the problem on its head and I essentially said, chance or randomness rather is something that's parasitic on design. We only call something random when it breaks a lot, breaks pre-existing design patterns that we've already identified. And so it changed the whole dynamic. Chance or, or rather randomness becomes a byproduct of design rather than the other way around. Well, that very quickly led to the question, well, what are the sorts of patterns that we use in practice to actually identify the effects of intelligence? And the uh, the method then of the design inference, I took really what was what's called Fisherian statistical significance testing and extended it. And the, these design inferences kick in uh, when you don't have a smoking gun, when you don't have the causal story, it's one thing if you see somebody shoot somebody and, you know, well, you know who, what the designer, who the designer is. But what if you see something that shows a certain pattern and then you don't know how it came about? What about that mound? Is it a burial mound or is it a naturally formed mound? What about that rock formation? Is it a naturally formed rock or is it an arrowhead? And so on the cover of Design Inference 2, we've got Mount Rushmore. Now that's obviously design and we know who the designer was, but aliens visiting planet Earth uh, would still have reason to say that is not a random chance formation, there is intelligence behind it. And so the whole point of this design inference was to come up with a method for reliably detecting intelligence, especially in these effect to cause reasonings where we see the patterns, but we don't necessarily know the causal story. So that's, and there are basically two criteria. You need something that's improbable, but then it also needs to be a particular type of pattern. It's got to be independent in some suitable way. And we define that in terms of a minimum description length. It's not enough just to have something improbable because let's say I throw a thousand marbles on the floor, the precise configuration is going to be highly improbable. But if it spells out, welcome to the design inference webinar, you're going to say, even if you don't know the precise forces that were working on those marbles, you'll know that there was an intelligence behind behind those marbles, assuming that configuration. So that gives you about a 20-year history of how, how yeah. this book came about. And we'll break some of that down here in more detail in a bit, but it's helpful to have that big picture view yeah. of kind of the goal of the book. Um, would you say that someone who is new to this conversation could actually just skip the first edition entirely and start reading the second edition or is there something that you know builds off of the first edition in this new book uh no i think it's uh the the first edition is entirely dispensable at this point in fact i i uh, almost wish that it just disappeared i mean a few <laughs> things that i included from the first edition in the uh, in an appendix, just so there's, there's continuity for people who did read the first edition. But I think the, the arguments are much tighter. The notation is better. Uh, you know, we extend these ideas much further, Winston in particular. Uh, the notion of specified complexity, he really nailed that down. So it's uh, it's a much better book. It's self-contained. It's uh, I think it's also much more user-friendly. I mean, I've talked to, uh, I remember talking to one person who read the first edition, read the second, and thought that the second was much easier to get through so it's i'm glad you really mentioned easy. that that yeah. appendix because i think for anyone that has read the first edition yeah. to to quickly open up to that appendix c and read about kind of the the difference between the first and second edition would be a motivating factor to to dive into the second edition because it really does contain very little of the first and a lot of new yeah. um kind of more robust writing so so that's really helpful to know um so I'm curious to hear from you, Winston, about how you became involved in this project and, and contributing to the writing of this second edition. 
Uh, yeah. So I worked with Bill Dembski when I was getting my PhD at Baylor. We did a bunch of work on evolutionary algorithms. Uh, some of that kind of stuff has come in here. I also did some work there developing specified complexity at the time. Uh, so when Bill went and got the copyright for design inference, so that he could do design inference too, I think he immediately was like, yes, I want Winston to come on and help me with the second edition. So, uh, yeah, that's well, I'm sure it's been a, a, a welcome addition. I don't know if any of you uh, joining have both copies handy, but you can see there there's a lot of new text in this new edition. It's uh, <laughs> twice the length of the original, a lot of writing. And so I'm sure it's been helpful to have, um, yeah, it's just some additional writing help and, and building out some of these ideas. Um, Bill, you mentioned that Winston was instrumental in working on this idea of specified complexity. So we'll come back to that later. I'll ask Winston to kind of explain that in more depth. Um, in the meantime, I'm wondering, my overall understanding of the book is that it deals with kind of a triangulation from probability and specification in order to draw this design inference. And I, I'm wondering if you know either of you can kind of explain what that means to triangulate from those two components to draw an inference about causation. Yeah. Um, Winston, do you want to try your hand? <laughs> at it? Uh, to triangulate from those two components. Yeah. The idea being that, and this has been sort of Bill's fundamental insight all the way back to the first edition of the design inference, was that you really need two things in order to infer design. You need to determine that whatever it is you're looking at is improbable and also that it's specified. So improbability is, you know, the one generally you're more familiar with. And it's the idea that the event is unlikely to happen by chance. Uh, so that's crucial, right? If the event is likely to happen by chance, well, then maybe it did happen by chance, and thus we would not infer that it was designed. Um, but the other thing, and Bill alluded to this earlier, is the fact that lots of things are highly improbable, uh, but they still can happen by chance. So you, you know, you break a pane of glass and you get a very particular shattering pattern, which no one has seen before. Uh, that's a highly improbable pattern, but we don't think, you know, someone deliberately broke that random pattern in that way. Uh, and you can do this, you know, with decks of cards, you shuffle the cards. No one has ever seen that particular order of cards before. It's highly improbable, but we don't think it's designed. And that's the fundamental important thing is, well, there's this other idea of specificity. Uh, and you can think of it sort of as being following a pattern or being sort of non-random in some sense. It doesn't just look like a random, it adheres to some sort of pattern that you recognize. And the idea is that when you have both something that's highly improbable and something that adheres to some independent pattern, that's what makes it be specified and complex. And that's the basis on which we conclude that something is designed. So I I realize that a lot of times a, um, a to draw the conclusion that something is improbable can be very intuitive. But other times I'm guessing that it's not. And so I'm wondering if one of you can explain how we can use things like probabilistic resources to determine that something truly is improbable. Yeah, well, that's one of the, the key insights that to say that something is improbable or has small probability is never something that just happens in isolation. It's with respect to a set of probabilistic resources. And so the idea there is if you, let's say, see 10 heads in a row, that's got a probability of about one in a thousand, which means that if you flip a coin about a thousand times, uh, you're going to be fairly likely to see 10 heads in a row. Flip it 10,000 times, the probabilities go up. Flip, do it a million times, and it's virtually certain that you'll see 10 heads in a row. But there's a balance there. So, you know, if, if I told you I flipped 10 heads in a row, you'd say, well, that's that's likely. Uh, but now let's change the scenario. Uh, let's, what would it take to get 20 heads in a row? That's about a one in a million probability. So let's imagine that uh, we're on the mall in Washington, D.C., and we have a million people, each with a coin that they're flipping. And whenever they flip tails, they sit down. So they start, somebody, they flip heads, they flip heads, they stay standing. So on average, first time, you've got a million people standing, next time, 500,000, next time, 250,000, next time, 125,000, and so on. After about 20 flip, after 20 flips, you're likely to find one person standing, Okay. So what allowed that to happen? We don't tell the person that's standing, hey, you're really 
really amazing coin flipper, you know, what's your secret to getting 20 heads in a row? Uh, it's that there were enough probabilistic resources to make that probable. The question, though, then arises, well, what are the probabilistic resources as we go beyond that? What about the, the world as a whole? If everybody is flipping coins, what might we see? Turns out if everybody throughout human history were doing nothing but flipping coins, they would not be likely to see 100 heads in a row. And so that's this balance of probabilistic resources. And then we can pose that question at the scale of the universe. The universe is, in terms of probabilistic resources, actually pretty small in the sense that you only have about, you have about 10 to the 90 elementary particles. But getting improbable events at the level of what we call a universal probability bound of 10 to the 150 is actually quite easy in terms of just... Um, you know, the three uh, a protein with 300 amino acids. If it's if you're just looking at the random sequences of amino acids, it's going to be well below that improbability. So when I say that below, I mean it's even a smaller probability than that one in ten to the one fifty. So, uh, so if you now there there's some arguments. I mean evolutionists are going to say, well, that's not the relevant probability for these genetic systems. And I get that. But the point is, we're, we're just talking about probabilities in general. And so it's, uh, you know, what are the probabilistic resources for bringing something about? Unless there are enough probabilistic resources, you know, we should not think that something is probable. So pro how probable, how, whether something is a small probability depends on the probabilistic resources, but then you need that other other ingredient also the specification and i think the the way i used to you know my public talks usually illustrate specification as the right sort of pattern for eliminating chances you put a have an archer shooting at a wall the arrowhead's very small the wall's large highly improbable where that arrowhead is going to land but now two scenarios one every time the arrow lands you paint a target around it so that the arrow is squirrely in, a, in the bullseye. It's matching a pattern, but it's a factitious pattern. It's a pattern that you fabricated, you know, but it's it's not something that's going to allow you to infer that you're dealing with a world-class archer. On the other hand, if you fix the target and then have somebody shoot and they keep hitting the bullseye, then you do legitimately draw a design inference. And it's that independence of pattern uh, from the uh, improbable event that's what does the triangulation. And it turns out in general, we do that in terms of uh, a Kolmogorov of complexity or a uh, minimum description length. So it's small probability, which ends up being a Shannon information notion, and then short description length, that ends up is what gets us the independence. And that's Kolmogorov of complexity. These are both uh, standard information theory and specified complexity then ends up combining those notions. And it's really to Winston's credit that he saw clearly how to do that. Uh, and so that's one reason uh, Design Inference 2 is, is uh, so much better a book than it would have been if, if it just had been my hands on it. You know, So we have my expertise as a, a pure mathematician, probabilist, and Winston's as a software engineer, uh, theoretical computer scientist. And that uh, I think this this combination I, I regard it as providential. That's fantastic. So these are, you know, the high level concepts in the book, but there's there's one other that I'd like us to touch on, which is before we jump into the questions here, which is the idea of your explanatory filter that was in the first book. And I understand it's still in this book, but it's been modified to some extent. Can you explain the the need for this filter? What is the um, what is a an example of how you would use this filter, and also how it's been updated since the first edition? Yeah. Winston, do you want to jump in there? I've been talking quite a bit. You're, <laughs> yeah. You're so the explanatory filter really takes the ideas we've been talking about of looking at the specification and complexity, and sort of breaks it down into sort of a flowchart form. It's depicted as a flowchart, sort of as a step-by-step -step process, as it were. So the idea is that you look at your event, you observe the event, and then you first ask a question: Is is it improbable? Right. And so you say, okay, well, no, this was probable. Then you go off to the side and say, oh, it's probably chance. If you say, okay, it isn't probable, then you have to keep going down the flow chart. And then you have to ask the question, is it specified? Does it follow some sort of independent pattern? Is it sort of look non-random in some sense? And if you say, actually, there is no pattern. It just looks like random junk, whatever. 
then you, again, you fall off and say, oh, well, that's probably random chance of some sort. But if you say, yes, it is in fact specified and you keep going down the flow chart, then you come to the conclusion, well, this is probably designed. So that's, that's the explanatory filter. And the idea is that whenever we look around the world and we're trying to distinguish between events that have just happened by chance and those events which are actually the action to design, we're constantly sort of implicitly applying this filter. Uh, the could... difference... Go ahead. You wanted to jump in, Bill? No, you go ahead, please. Uh, the difference with the first edition is that the first edition's explanatory filter had an extra step in there. Uh, they had a first step where you had to eliminate... Uh, contingency. Uh, that is, you had to consider, like, is this event which had to happen? Uh, so from my perspective, it wasn't really necessary because an event that has to happen is an event that happens with probability one. So that's already low, a high probability event. And so there's no need really to have an extra step in there. And it tended to cause confusion uh, because people tended to think, oh, you look at a first step and you say, is this something that would happen by natural law as opposed to chance. But the fact is every chance hypothesis, every sort of theory about how something could happen by random is a combination of sort of pure random chance and natural law. So they always have to work together. So it really didn't make a lot of sense to talk about natural law by itself. It's always chance and necessity together, not just chance or not just necessity. They always work in concert. So we simplified that and sort of avoided some confusion that resulted by just saying, no, it's just a matter of, is it probable? And that covers both what would have been uh, sort of the non-contingent events in the original filter and the chance events in the original filter. Well okay, said. So Listen, that, that's what I was ahead, actually going to yeah. jump in. I, I would just add that our notion of chance is very broad. So it includes things like tossing a coin. So something like pure chance, independent and identically distributed random variables, but includes any sort of stochastic process. And it includes deterministic processes because when probabilities collapse to zero and one, as in deterministic processes, it's still you know, it's still probability. It's just that it's a particular random probability. So this actually speaks to a type of criticism that Richard Dawkins has raised, where he said, he'll say evolution is uh, quintessentially non-random. Okay, but but he thinks of random as this kind of pure higgledy piggledy, independent, identically distributed random variables, and uh, we're covering what he means by chance variations and natural selection, or what he'll call cumulative selection. So we're, we're, we've got him covered, is, is what I want to say. Okay. So I've got one other question that I'd like us to um, cover before we jump into um, audience Q&A, and that is with regards to the application of the design inference and explanatory filter to biology. So as I understand it, the the inference itself, the heuristic that you've developed is very powerful for a number of things. You just described, you know, kind of an everyday example of um, darts or arrows being shot at a wall or um, other. Th I've heard you talk about applications in forensics or something like that. But as I understand it, where it becomes controversial and where there has been a lot more pushback <laughs> is when this is applied to the world of biology. So my question for both of you is, why? Why is it different in the world of biology? Why is it so much harder to accept this uh, thesis? Well, uh, let me let me start. I mean, I think a big part is just worldview questions. I mean, you know, and I, I experienced this uh, firsthand, the sort of cancel culture of Darwinism before cancel culture was a thing, you know, out there. But it's, uh, you know, this was a bridge too far for people to think that, that design could actually be a scientific Theory, you know, it would be one thing to say design argument. Oh, that's that's some old-fashioned philosophy. That's theology. But to say no, they're they're reliable methods that have scientific traction that can tell us that we're dealing with uh, intelligence. That's that was uh, that became an issue. Uh, so um, uh, I think the the other thing though is uh, you know cases of plagiarism and. Uh, you know, data falsification, for instance. These have been big news. I mean, Claudine Gay, Harvard's Claudine Gay, just resigned over plagiarism, and uh, Stanford's Mark Tessier-Levine uh, uh, resigned over data falsification, basically reusing data sets in his, in his research, you know? And so there's there were clear design inferences, the probability 
days were could be easily calculated. And uh, as a result, uh, there was enormous pressure on them to resign, and they did resign. Thing is, in biology, the probabilities are much more difficult to calculate. I mean, these are not toy problems. Uh, there's often a challenge to find systems that are complex enough so that you have the improbability uh, that you need to draw design inference, but also simple enough so that you can actually analyze them. Uh, and so this is this has become this has been a challenge. And so we lay out the method, but it's really for the biologists to apply the method. So some of the best work in that regard is. Uh, from a Discovery Institute fellow, uh, Douglas Axe, who uh, has looked at certain, the evolvability of certain uh, enzyme folds. And uh, it's a very interesting argument because he will he he's not going to say, oh, what's the probability of just getting uh, a particular sequence of amino acids from, to, from all the possible amino acid sequences? He's looking at how evolvable are these systems on Darwinian principles and he's getting improbabilities at the level of 10 to the minus 60 10 to the minus 70 so uh but it's uh you know it these are difficult problems you know and i think this is where uh, i think biologists often hide behind the complexities because it's like uh you know prove us wrong show that Dar darwinism didn't happen because you know and then they they can dispute, well, you must have missed something in your probability calculation. There has to be a gradual Darwinian pathway. And if there's a gradual Darwinian pathway, well, then it's it's suitably probable, you know. So, um, and uh, I don't know, Winston, maybe you want to even speak to this whole question of uh, Darwinism being a probability amplifier, because that's one of the big objections to using these methods in biology. Or go where you um, want with it. <laughs> Yeah, so of course the standard Darwinian line is that well actually, you know, biological complex biological systems aren't improbable because, you know, Darwinian evolution essentially makes it probable. At least that would be the line if they bothered to understand uh the argument being made in the book that they would make. Um and I think sure that there could be definitely the probabilities are different when you're considering could this arise by Darwinian evolution versus uh, random, pure random chance scenario. But I think we've come up with various good reasons to conclude that various evolutionary scenarios are very improbable. I mean, most obvious, I think, is origin of life, uh, because if you're looking at origin of life, you don't have Darwinian evolution in operation yet. And yet we know it's really, really hard to build a self-replicating system. Um, so we know that's highly improbable. That's not a question. And then I think you, we look at some of the work... Uh, Bill referenced the work by Doug Axe, where he looks at how hard it would be to evolve new protein folds. And that's something that would have had to happen repeatedly across evolutionary history for that account to work. And I think we've got good reasons to include. No, those are, that's very, very improbable. That would trigger a design inference. And I think you can look at it at higher level things like the development of flight or any of these other amazing things we see in the biological world that I think there's piles upon piles of cases in those where we'd say, actually, we look at this, we can consider whether or not a Darwinian evolution would work, and we can see the gradualistic account doesn't work in many cases. Um, and it actually triggers a design inference over and over again. Okay. So I have I have a couple other questions written down myself, but I think I'm just going to jump right into the audience questions here because they, they're asking you know similar things. And one of them is about the intended audience of this book. So what I'm gathering is that there, in a way, there are layers of intended audiences. There, <laughs> there are um, kind of field-specific insights and um, uh, theses being made. And then there are broader insights that apply to kind of the intelligent design movement. And then there are even broader things that speak to this kind of worldview debate. Um, and it ties in with culture and lots of other things. So um, let me just start with a couple of these questions about intended audience. So um, this person says, why include so much pure math in the book that um, with this that is likely to go over the heads of most people who are not mathematicians? Are you targeting mathematicians or are you targeting educated laymen? No. Well, I think we, we, we need to go back uh, to the first edition. I mean, it was it was a dissertation 
uh, in philosophy of science, foundations of probability theory. It was published in a Cambridge monograph series. So it was Cambridge Studies in Probability, Induction, and Decision Theory. So a monograph is basically the equivalent of a journal article. It goes through an academic editor and their referees. It's just that it's too long to appear in a standard journal. So it was written as a uh, as as a uh, technical monograph. Uh, that said, when I wrote it, I did want to try to reach out and pump people's intuitions about these ideas so that it would have a broader audience. And it turned out that it was the best-selling Cambridge monograph, uh, philosophical monograph over the previous five years. At least that's what sticks in my memory. Uh, this has all the technical firepower, the second edition that the first edition has, and then some. I mean, they've got a chapter on specified complexity, uh, which uh, which takes these ideas much further than the, the, the first edition. But you also have, I mean, the very first two chapters, I think, are very accessible. So the idea, uh, from my vantage in writing it, and uh, I'll let Winston uh, describe his, his thoughts about audience, but was to try to appeal as broadly as possible uh, give people who don't have the technical background at least something, and then those who do have the technical background also a place to fill in the details. And there is a rhetorical dimension to this. I mean, this book uh, arrives on a scene that is uh, an academic scene that's still very materialistic, hostile in many ways to intelligent design. So, uh, you know, I did not feel that we were in a position just to say, to hand wave and say, well, you know, these results have been handled elsewhere, so you can refer them here. You know, it just, uh, it seemed that we wanted something that was self-contained, where people could actually see the nuts and bolts of the argument. At the same time, though, uh, there's plenty uh, for for the non-technical reader. And this is one of the things we encourage in, uh, I think, the, the introduction, where it's like if you get into some technical material that's too much for you, skip ahead. You know, there will always be something there for you. You know, so that's, uh, that's what we tried to do. Are we successful at that? Was that the right strategy? Well, that's that's where we landed. So, uh, Well, I'll say personally that reading the introduction was very helpful for me because it kind of gave a, a roadmap for what to expect in the book so that I can, based on my own, you know, um, background research, I know what I can and can't dive into and, and understand from the book. So I think I'd encourage every reader to don't skip the introduction because that'll help you understand um, what to expect in the rest of the book. So. Did you want to add anything, Winston, to that? Um, I mean, I would just say perhaps the book is essentially is for everyone, but, you know, not every part of the book is for everyone. Right. So feel free to skip the sections that aren't part for you. We won't be hurt. Okay. That's that's good advice. Um, okay. So let's let's work through some of these questions in, in no particular order. Um, one of the, the first questions that came in was, what in your opinions has been the primary objections to ID and specifically this book? among the mainstream scientific community? Well, you know, I think you've got the Darwinists who see the Darwinian mechanism as this probability amplifier. So they, they will, many of them will just say, the method is inapplicable. You know, it's just, uh, there are these possible uh, Darwinian pathways, usually what they'll have to say is that if you're trying to evolve something like a protein fold or whatever, there's a path in which structures and functions are changing. We don't know the history, uh, but they have to be there. And if that's, his, if, if that's the case, uh, then you don't have the improbability working for you. So it becomes more of an a priori type. Uh, this couldn't be right. We know the Darwinian mechanism is is so powerful. So you're missing something. I think that's uh, that's what's going on on the biological front. And then uh, there are uh, competing views of probabilistic or statistical rationality. And I think in the earlier edition and so in my earlier life, I think I was tended much more toward a Fisherian statistical significance testing as opposed to a Bayesian approach, uh, which is a different type of uh, 
probabilistic rationality. I'm, I'm, I was familiar with it, uh, but I, 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 I kind of put them in opposition. And Winston convinced me that actually there's no need for an opposition. We can run the design inference through a Fisherian approach. We can run it through a Bayesian approach. So, um, so I think a, a lot of the objections against the first edition as somehow failing on account of uh, being wedded to a certain view of probabilistic rationality that others wouldn't accept. I think we, we, we don't have to worry about that anymore. So those those are the two main things that I would see. Winston, I, I don't know, what's uh, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think those are probably what I would identify as sort of the main things, leaving aside some common misconceptions and such that people had uh, which aren't very interesting. Uh, the essential thing is to say, you know, Darwinian evolution makes a problem. And talking about probability amplifier, as you talked about it, or you know, getting caught up in arguments over Fisher versus Bayes. Uh, so I think, you know, I think we have really improved the second edition's handling of both of those issues. I mean, I, I guess one thing I would add, thank you, Winston, is that I mean, there there are people who it just seems purposely want to misunderstand. Uh, what this inference is. So you'll have somebody like a Professor Dave who will say basically, you know, it's all just improbability, ignores the question of, of specification, then gives a counterexample showing, well, I mean, here we've got something improbable and you don't need to explain that by chance. And uh, there's also a uh, philosopher, Colin House, and I cite him in the book where he takes the same line. I mean, it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's like, just purposely not comprehending what's there, not willing to, you know, it's, uh, you know, I've, I've said it till the cows come home that you need both, you know, you said it with the triangulation, you need both improbability and specification. And it's, I think some people just ignore the specification and then it's, well, uh, you know, then it becomes easy to refute us, right? You know, but, uh, but the refutation itself is, is deeply problematic. So there are several questions in here about you know, the application of the design inference or of the explanatory filter. And and one a couple of them ask about the, the SETI program. Um, so let me read a couple of these questions back to back and then let you address um, both of them. So uh, Robert Duvall says, SETI searching has been going on for decades, mostly signal analysis. How does that apply to this research and this discussion? And then um, separately, Tim... Uh, Farage, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, says, suppose that SETI picks up a thousand signals represented by zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, et cetera. This is very unlikely to happen by chance, and it has a short description. So it seems we could deduce it was designed, but it could be a rotating pulsar, for example, that gave the signal. So how do we eliminate this as being designed? Yeah. Well, I think with the Tim Farage's uh Counter example, uh, the design inference isn't just about knocking down a single chance hypothesis. You have to sweep the field clear of all relevant chance hypotheses. So uh, if you've got an alternating sequence like that, I mean, there's there's a necessity that seems to be operative there. And so what you know, could there be a physical process that gives you that? Yes, indeed. You know, I mean, if I get 100 heads in a row, it could be that I'm flipping a two-headed coin, you know, so it'll definitely land that. Uh, so getting 100 heads in a row is not going to convince you that there's a designer behind that if that is within your stock of uh, chance hypotheses. So that, so you always have to be clear on what, what are the relevant ha chance hypotheses and then uh, than to knock them down. Uh, so in the case of that, that uh, you know, I think we would we would be able to allow that there's a pulsar, and uh, there would be no design inference uh, to be drawn. Remind me, what 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 was the first question? Uh, well, the first was just the in general the relevance of this um, hypothesis to the program SETI. Okay, yeah, I think with the. Uh, SETI, I mean, it's it's interesting. Some of the SETI researchers, when they've put out into space, as it were, a time capsule bottle, uh, you know, they'll put uh, something with which has a lot of information. It'll encode certain things about the human race and so on. Uh, but you know, typically, what they're looking for is uh, you know high uh, some sort of peaked frequency 
uh, distribution, which I think could be the result of, uh, of of some sort of natural process. I mean, the the, the example that comes to mind, uh, you know, of uh, of SETI that's 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 very popular is from the movie Contact or the book Contact, where a long sequence of prime numbers comes in from outer space. Now that I think would uh, likely generate a design inference. It does in the movie uh, at that key moment where that sequence is discovered. One of the radio astronomers says, "This isn't noise. This has structure." Okay, well, and that's chance and design, uh, and indeed they infer uh, a um, an intelligence, but. The real life SETI program has discovered nothing like that. So I think what you need to do is, you know, what what sorts of things are you looking for? What sorts of improbabilities would there be? And are you considering all the relevant chance hypotheses that you might need to knock down? I mean, if uh, you know, if uh, if you got a signal from outer space that in uh, Unicode was uh, an English text explaining the the cure for cancer. And say, well, there's there's an intelligence behind that. If you could rule out that that signal was generated on Earth, you know, well, it seems then you'd have good evidence that there was an alien intelligence. So, uh, SETI, I mean, there's nothing to preclude it from uh, for a design inference from very convincingly uh, inferring design for alien signals. It's just we haven't seen anything like that. So I think this would be a good example to to try to break down the um, the meaning of specified complexity. So what, how does specified complexity allow us to differentiate between a pattern like zero one zero one zero one and a pattern like a sequence of prime numbers? Uh, I'm not sure it would let you distinguish. I mean, if the if it's uh, if you're doing random coin tosses, if that's your probability distribution, you're getting 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, just repeating. I mean, it's got a very short description, repeat 0, 1, thousand times or whatever, and it's going to be highly improbable. But again, you know, it's what is the, pro what is the, 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 the context probability the... distribution that's mm -hmm. there. On the other hand, uh, you know, with something like uh, prime numbers, uh, that is going to, you know, how is that going to come about by chance? I mean, you know, what we, you can write a computer program that spits out prime numbers, but that's a designed system that's generating a design system. So you haven't really dealt with the, the design issue there. You haven't eliminated it. So, uh, you know, it's these, these are context dependent inferences. They depend on your background knowledge. You're not going to be able to draw a design inference when you're listening to a language where you have no idea that it is a language. It could, for all you know, be gibberish, you know. But if you know enough about the language, then you might say, oh, okay, I understand what they're saying. And then you know that the, what, what is being said is not. Uh, random, that there is design intelligence behind it. I don't know. Winston, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I think it might be worth emphasizing the point that, so the design inference doesn't really tell you what is or isn't probable. So the design inference, as we're articulating it, assumes that you elsewhere have an idea of what is or isn't probable and is saying, you know, for those things that are low probable, low, have low probability, which of those would we actually infer design from? So when we look at, say, 1010 versus the prime number sequence, the fundamental difference is we think it's pretty likely, a priori, that there could be something out there generating a 1010 sequence without you know someone having designed it. That seems like something that seems plausible. But if we think about the a process that would be outputting a sequence of prime numbers, we think that's highly improbable. Uh, and now it's not really the design inference proper to talk about why that's improbable or not, uh, but we pretty much agree, can agree that that is in fact the case. And so once you take that information, you know the one is improbable and the other is not actually that improbable, then you plug that into the design inference and it gives you the conclusion. Yeah, we don't think 1010 is designed because, well, it's not improbable, uh, but we do think that prime number sequence be designed because it is improbable. Okay. Uh, how, how much is a Bayesian approach figuring into what you just said? Uh, well, certainly I think that the notion that, that sort of some things are more probable than others fits very nicely into a kind of a Bayesian thing where we can say, well, we know there are, you know, the prior probability of some sort of 1010 generator seems pretty high. Uh, the probability of a 
you know, prime number generator is low. And of course, you've got to have, you know, your your reasons for those Bayesian uh, priors, and that's a whole uh, discussion on its own. Uh, I think that you're not that different if you're going to go down a Fisherian route, that you've got, you there, you have a notion of you've got the set of relevant chance hypotheses. Uh, and that's just essentially the equivalent to the set of Bayesian hypotheses that have sufficient prior probability to be worth considering. Yeah. Okay. Good. So there are a couple of other um, examples given um, where people are wondering how do you apply this um, thesis to to something. So, for example, could you concisely outline <laughs> your present approach for measuring the information content in a physical entity such as Mount Rushmore or Michelangelo's David sculpture? You actually were doing. So I actually do examples. calculate some numbers from Mount Rushmore in the specified complexity chapter in the book, and I specifically sort of compare it to uh, the face on Mars that many of you probably were familiar with. That NASA came back with uh, pictures from Mars, and something looked suspiciously like a face. And so there, I go through the probabilities. I sort of there, I figure we can do sort of a back of the envelope estimate of probability by considering, you know, how many identifiable features can we see on Mount Rushmore versus in the face. And of course, there's a lot more identifiable features on Mount Rushmore because you've got the eye and you've got different parts of the eyes. You've got a bunch of different faces. You've got a bunch of different aspects of the face. Whereas if you go to the face on Mars, there's like four things that look kind of face-like. And so if you get some sort of guess, like how probable is it that each of those uh, features could be present, the face on Mars, it's kind of improbable, but you know, given the amount of you know, random pictures of things, there's a good chance that it would show up. Uh, but, you know, Mount Rushmore has so many features that it would be so improbable uh, that that particular configuration or something that would sufficiently resemble a face like it uh, would happen that we would conclude, yes, Mount Rushmore is clearly the result of design, but the face in Mars is not. Okay. Um, a couple questions about, again, the terminologies here. So, uh, Mark, Champneys says, can you provide a simple definition of specification for use in conveying your thesis to others? I tend to use words like having purpose or function. Winston, why don't you yeah. handle Proper, So properly speaking, having purpose or function is a subset of specification. Uh, so specification is sort of the broad sense of having any sort of patternicity to it. Um, so you could, of course, if you want to just communicate to someone who's sort of not convinced or something, you could just focus on function. That's fine, because that's just a subset of specification. Uh, if you want to think of it more simply, you can think of it as sort of non-randomness or patterned is kind of these kinds of kinds of things I would think in terms of uh, try, if you're just trying to convey it to a lay audience. Uh, being me, I think the best way to think about it is, you know, minimum description length ideas, uh, but that might not be so easy to convey to sort of just in a general uh, population. Well, but I, I think we, we need to say something about that because that, that really does does nail it down. Okay, that's uh, the, the thing is you can, um, for instance, I mean, this is an example we consider, you know, I once, uh, I once saw five uh, Grand Am, same model cars, same color driving along on a road. You know, what's the inference? They're right in succession. Well, um, you know, it was uh, probably a stunt by a local car dealership. So what if we saw 10, you know, white Honda Accords, current model, four doors, right in a row in succession? Uh, it's actually, I mean, it's pretty short description to say 10 uh, white Honda Accords current model, okay? But what if they were all mixed up? It was a white Honda, it was a golden Toyota, it was this, it was that, and the other thing. That would be a much longer description. The probabilities might be the same, okay? And there may be as many Toyota Celica or Toyota Camrys around as Honda Accords. Those are pretty equivalent. You know, So if you have all these different ways of having the cars, there could be many different ways of having 10 cars. They could all be equally improbable. But it would be a much shorter description to say 10 of the same as opposed to first a white Honda, second a gold Camry, third a Chevy, a red Chevy Malibu, fourth this. You know, that becomes a long description. And those long descriptions, they work against the improbability. 
And actually, in the, our very definition of specified complexity, what we do is we have two notions of information. There's Shannon information, which basically converts a probability to a number of bits. So if you've got, let's say, 20, uh, 20 coin tosses, well, that's one in 10 to one and two to the 20 probability, but that's also 20 bits of information. But then we can also determine how many bits it takes to describe something. And it's that difference in the description length from the improbability as developed as with Shannon information. So it's Shannon information minus Kolmogorov information, Kolmogorov being the shortest description length, that that's what gives us a, this measure of specified complexity. And it's so it's the short description that's balancing against the improbability. If you have a longer description, you need a lot, lot less improbability. And uh, there, there's some great examples. Uh, Winston has one. Uh, I don't know if you remember the, off the top of your head, the the uh, Star Wars versus oh. uh, Spaceballs <laughs> example, you know. But uh, uh, you know, do you remember what it what was? So in in Star Wars, Darth Vader says, "No, I am your father." And in the parody uh, Spaceballs, a uh, dark helmet says. I'm your let's see, father's brother's cousin's former roommate. Uh, the point being, that's a very long description, and therefore we intuitively know that doesn't mean anything. Uh, whereas the short description given by Darth Vader means something, and that's the fundamental insight of sort of description length. Yeah. So Bill, this, I like your example of the the cars. I think that's something that you know is very relatable for folks. Yeah. Uh, although we did have one comment here that says. Uh, from our friend Richard Greeling is is a series of prime numbers. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong one here. He said, if you see uh, ten white um, Teslas in a row, you know you're in Seattle. So there there can be some <laughs> contextual clues that is just um, you got to take into account the probabilities of the car that's distributions. Right. It's very exactly. Important. Um, but he also has another question here. Um, sorry, let me find this again. So he says, is this series of prime numbers more or less indicative of design than say a Fibonacci sequence? How would you deal with that question? <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it's, it's going to be, I think it's going to be contextual. Where are these, where are these numbers coming from? So it does seem for instance, with Fibonacci numbers that they come up with various uh, biological systems, petal patterns in various plants and whatnot. But uh, you know, the question is where did, those plants come from, you know, if, if they're designed, then, you know, then getting design out of their, uh, you know, the, any sort of numerical patterns such as Fibonacci sequences isn't the problem. Now, uh, I remember that that was a, an objection raised way back to when I was uh, publishing Design Inference and then its sequel, No Free Lunch, where people were saying, well, but you can get this naturally. Well, what does it mean naturally? I mean, if you have a design system that produces something, you know, uh, that you, know, you, you can't just dismiss it as uh, that product of something that's a design system as as undesigned, you know. So um, and so with with prime numbers, uh, again, I think, you know, the, the sorts of considerations that uh, Winston raised about, you know, how probable is it? But, you, you know, you're going to need to look at the, the systems in question if you've got, uh, you know, a. I don't know, some system where you've got all sorts of very simple computer programs that are trying to do number theory, you might get a, a prime number generating program, you know, but it's, uh, but, you know, even that whole system would have been set up in a design way, you know, so that's, uh, and that, this actually touches on uh, uh, what, what's going to be a sequel for us is this notion of conservation of information. We had hoped to deal with this in second edition of the design inference, but it just got too unwieldy. But it's uh, what well, the, the point there is, uh, if you have a process that produces something designed, that process itself has to be informed with design. And just tracking that sort of design and the information there is, is what, what conservation of information does. So uh, these, these problems of design ramify very deep. And, uh, you know, I think there are people there often playing a little shell game or something where it's like, you know, they think they've gotten rid of the design or they can hide it, but it's, it's still there, you know, it's so. 
smuggled in somewhere and yeah so i'm glad you raised the sorry go ahead prime number sequence probably his more indicative design and that would just be because the probabilities involved in imagining what it would take to naturally form a process that produced prime numbers seems much much less probable than randomly form some sort of process that would produce a fibonacci sequence that's helpful yeah i i was trying to think about you know the the definition of a prime number only divisible by itself, well, what is a natural cause that would lead to that? It's such a kind of independent meaning um, from, yeah, the context of a right. plant or something, yeah. Fibonacci is, you know, this plus this repeated. And so you can right. imagine processes yeah. which might approximate addition relatively readily. Uh, and yeah. so that's less st strong of a design inference I would draw based on a Fibonacci okay. sequence. No, that's, that's good. Yeah, I've... Uh, I've thought about these issues, but I, yeah, I think that that nails it because with the Fibonacci, you're just looking at the two previous numbers and adding them together, but there's no uh, closed form formula for generating the next prime number. I mean, it's mm -hmm. you just basically you got to crank through it and figure out, okay, you know, <laughs> keep dividing or keep, you know, you're going to have to step by step figure out if the next one is, is indeed prime. Um, so this kind of gets to another um, question that was submitted. Stefan asks, if the universe is designed, including the laws of physics, then are there really any chance events? <laughs> he says, for example, that the pattern of a shattered piece of glass, didn't that pattern result from the operation of the designed laws? Um, even if you have laws, and let's say designed laws, if you think of everything as deterministic, there's still questions of uh, initial configuration, you know. So how those those laws are going to be operating on different initial conditions, and so you can get very different behaviors. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, philosopher of science, John Ehrman, and he has a book, A Primer on Determinism, where he looks at a, a uh, Newtonian uh, universe. Uh, and basically, he uh, he says, okay, if you had a Newtonian universe, um, you can imagine things as it were coming in uh, from infinity, kind of asymptotically, and just you know acting as ran as randomizers. Uh, so it's you you know, and it's still everything is deterministic, and yet there's there's a sense in which there's also an indeterminacy there. I'm, I'm not stating it as as well as I might, but. Uh, the uh yeah the uh the, you know i think having these laws uh doesn't allow you to get rid of the design problem i think the initial conditions that's a place where the the laws are not going to uh deal with things um and uh, and it on the also it does seem that we are dealing with some sort of fundamental indeterminacy in the world you know it's it's not just the sort of Newtonian or Einsteinian vision where it is all deterministic in the end. So um, uh, and when, once you have that, then I, I don't think uh, you can just say that everything is designed. Um, I mean, one of the arguments also in our book is that actually, in a sense, chance is an epiphenomenon or a byproduct of design. You know, that's, uh, that, that, that's an interesting argument. So that, uh, in a sense, you see, humans, I mean, we do things that are designed. You know, if I write a uh, text on my computer, uh, those words, everything is intentional there, and yet there are statistical patterns to the uh, the, wor the the letters that we use. Uh, you know, letter E is going to appear 13% of the time. Letter U will appear almost with probability one after the, the letter Q. You know, so there are all these probabilistic sorts of things that apply to our entirely intentional use of words. It's because of the, the idiosyncrasies, if you will, of uh, the, the means that we use to express our intelligence that chance then arises. You know? And uh, so that's, that's an argument we make in the book. I think it might understand why why we need 500 pages to, to really flesh this out, because it's not always as simple as, as it may appear. So I think it might be worth emphasizing in response to this question. It's the design inference. The point is when we infer design. So you, yeah, of course, as Christian, I believe the whole universe is designed. So ultimately, in some sense, everything is a result of design. But the question is, on which things can I infer design from? And so, yes, you could say maybe the shards of glass are actually designed in some sense because 
you know, providence of God or the design, uh, the physical laws of the universe are, are controlling that in some sense. But the question of the design inference is, can I infer from that result that it's designed? And in some cases, even though things are designed, I can't actually infer design from them. And would you say there's a question about this somewhere in here and I can't pull it up right now, but would you say that it's a, it's designed to be a conservative inference as opposed to a, a liberal one? Yeah. So the, the intention of the design inference is that if you can't infer design, that doesn't mean design isn't there because uh, the designer could have done a, a good job of hiding themselves. And obviously there's interesting things in stenography and such where we've specifically worked at ways of trying to hide our design in things. Um, and so if you're, if the designer is doing a good job of hiding, yeah, you're not going to infer design. So it's not like we're going to be able to catch every case of design, but the intention is that if we do detect design, then yes, we're pretty sure it was designed. So probably more I, false I would, negatives than false yeah, positives using this. Yeah, yeah. I would I would add that uh, I think the the design inference it tries to give chance every chance to succeed. You know, as it were. <laughs> you know, so it's so uh, we don't. You know, if you're a detective, you don't want to increase your caseload by attributing something to foul play when it could be natural causes. Uh, so let's let's give natural causes. Let's give chance as much opportunity to succeed. Uh, at the same time, I wouldn't say that the design inference is an inference of last resort. You know, I mean, it's it's you know, I think this is what happens with biology. I mean, they're you know, Darwinian biologists. It's like as though they're kicking and screaming. You know, we can't can't let a design inference in here. So, uh, but. You know, we 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 try to. You know, it, it is an eliminative argument in some ways. We have to. We give chance an opportunity, but then we see whether it's adequate. This is not an argument from ignorance. I mean, it's an eliminative eliminative induction. Uh, we we get rid of things, and as we get rid of certain options, then other options come to the fore. Uh, unless we're able to eliminate chance, uh, we we're, we're not going to be able to draw a design inference. But uh, again, it's not an argument from last resort. Uh, we, but uh, but you know, it's a design inference is an inference. It's work. You've got to you've actually got to show something. Um, Winston, there are several questions in here about your work on depend dependency graphs, and um, so there are questions like, you know, does this relate to the design inference, or how does the de the dependency graph reinforce design inference for protein data? Can you speak to that? Uh, okay. Um, so the approach with dependency graphs is is a little bit to say, let's pretend that we don't have these arguments for design. And let's just look at the pattern of life and seeing, can we argue from design for the pattern of life? So in a dependency graph context, I wouldn't say, oh, look at the protein. The protein folds hard to evolve, although I think that's very much true. But so, so let's look at the pattern of these proteins, and can we make an, an inference and argue that actually looks like how a designer would have done it? So ultimately, I think it ends up reinforcing the design inference to give us additional reasons to conclude that something's designed, but it tries to be sort of separate and provide an additional line of evidence that's not directly associated with arguing against an evolutionary process or that sort of thing. Okay. And then there's a couple of questions here about turning the, um, the filter into either an algorithm or some kind of AI system that can be <laughs> applied more directly. So have you all given any thought to that? I'll, I'll read one of the questions specifically. Um, Paul says, is there any AI system which has posited anything like the design inference as a mechanism to answer how one identifies design? This is a slightly different question. Um, he says, asking chat GPT yields vagueness. Identifying design can be done by observing various elements and characteristics, functionality and purpose, understanding the context and intended message. So there's a couple of different questions there about the use of AI and the design filter? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, I've been using ChatGPT. I mean, it's uh, it's got some amazing capabilities. And uh, I wonder if you train it properly, give it uh, enough information, can it look at a situation and say, okay, here's, here's a design inference. Uh, the thing is, I think uh, it's also been built with certain biases against intelligent design. I mean, for instance, I put it through its paces about what are some possible explanations for life's origin. And after 10 or 12 rounds of it, it still didn't raise the possibility of intelligent design. You know? <laughs> it's, uh, 
<laughs> you know, and then when I finally pressed it, I said, is there something you've really left off? It's like, well, there is this religious option. You know? <laughs> so, it's, uh, uh, so uh, but yeah, I, I could, um, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question to what degree can, um, can this not just be a, an, uh, an art, if you will, or something that humans uh, pull an art, this argument together, but can it become, as it were, a design inference engine that uh, that can just crank through and say, okay, this is designed. Uh, and usually you can't say this isn't designed, but this we don't have reason to believe that it's designed. You know, So it's because uh, designers can hide their designs, mm -hmm. uh, as Winston pointed out. Winston, do you want to? Yeah, I can't say I've spent time thinking about whether you could uh, get one of the artificial intelligences we have now to be trying to draw design inferences or talk about the design inference. Obviously, the state of the art essentially is an imitative thing where they're trying to imitate uh, humans from having lots of input of how humans respond in different situations. Uh, but no, I haven't. can't say I've put thought into or done any experiments on trying to apply AI to these kind of questions. Ron asked the question, can software algorithms be used to detect design, such as looking for patterns and quality attributes and source code? Looking for, what was that bit about source code? Looking for patterns or um, certain attributes in the source code, in a piece of source code. Well, if you've got uh, something I mean, that's clearly... They confuse me a little bit because, I mean, source code, of course, is like a computer program source code. And, of course, you know, that's design. So I'm not sure why you're trying to infer design in, in source code. Uh, certainly, you could program computers to identify certain kind of patterns we know about. And, you know, arguably, I think we do this when you have fraud detection algorithms and all that. They've identified particular patterns that, you know, typically, you know, they're improbable and you know, they adhere to some independent pattern. They're they're using specified complexity in operation, if they, even if they don't call it that. And so certainly those kinds of algorithms are in use are in, and are in operation. But turning back to biology, for example, if you have a stretch of DNA code or RNA code or some other um, biological code, is there a way that you could develop an algorithm that could look for those sorts of design patterns in the code? to differentiate from something that came about naturalistically? Uh, I mean, I think you're always going to have to be looking for something. You need some background knowledge to infer design. So, I mean, one of, one of the big questions I would say currently is the uh, COVID virus. Was it humanly engineered or was it from a wet market? And uh, could there be telltale signs of its being engineered humanly? Uh, and I think that is certainly possible. You know, I mean, I, I don't think we can just eliminate eliminate that. I mean, uh, Seth, uh, uh, Craig Venter, I mean, he had this program of synthetic genomics where he was imprinting into DNA his own initials and names of people who were working for him. I mean, that's uh, you know, you have those patterns in the DNA. You can tell that that was designed, and in fact, you can you could infer that it was a human who did that, you know, so, uh, so I think it's, you know, but you've got, you know, part of it with the design inference is you have to be asking the right questions, you need to be, know where you're looking. Uh, and, uh, you know, design inferences are one designer inferring the activity of another designer. You know, I think that's, and what's, what's happening is we usually don't see the other designer, but we see the marks of information left in the uh, the item of interest and then but we've we've got to know enough to know what we're looking for and it's got we've got to probably know something of of the same thing that's in the mind of that designer we have to have some there's got to be some commonality there and if there's not enough commonality we're not going to be able to draw design inference okay by the way i wanted to just stop and mention we have passed the the hour mark and i know some are having to drop off here in the evening but um, both of our co-authors here have agreed to stay on um, till uh, the half hour mark here. So we'll continue working through some of these questions um, for anyone that can stay on. Uh, there are a number of questions here about kind of the theistic implications of this book and the research that you guys have done. Um, so I'd like to you know ask a couple of those. Um, 
Kelton Walker says, how would you go about generating specifically theistic predictions and how do you think they would align with the more general results of the design inference? Uh, you know, theistic implications, I think those, those are always tricky with intelligent design because, uh, and this is a point that uh, philosopher Immanuel Kant made, that looking at patterns in nature, we can find an architect behind that. But he says the, the architect is still not somebody who gives being to the world, okay? And so this is always the issue with the creator. I mean, Winston is, uh, we're, we're writing a book titled Get Your Own Dust, and this is a joke, right, where scientists come to God, we can do everything you can do. God says, show me, and they say, well, we, we take some dust, and we then they're going to build a human being or whatever, and God says, get your own dust. So a uh, theistic creator God is always this transcendent, you know, being that's beyond the physical universe. Uh, design is looking for patterns in finite materials you know, finite physical objects. And so how do you go from that an inference about something that's finite to an infinite personal transcendent creator God? It's uh, the, the logic won't take you there. Now, on the other hand, if you are a Christian, you know, who or what could that designer be? You know, I mean, well, the, the options are limited. You know, they're limited to one. Uh, so it's, uh, so I think uh, intelligent design is conducive to Christian theism and theism generally, uh, but it's it doesn't it's not the only game in town. You know, uh, I remember years back being invited to the the Oxford Hindu Center, and uh, you know they were not theists in the Christian vein, and yet they were very open to the as ideas of intelligent design. I think anybody any religious tradition that sees a place for real teleology in the world. Uh, is going to be open to intelligent design. But I, I think the theological implications you can draw from intelligent design are going to be limited because it is a scientific program in the first instance. It's not a theological program. And I say that as somebody who wrote a book, Intelligent Design, The Bridge Between Science and Theology. But uh, as I explain in that book, I mean, at the base is the scientific program. If you don't have the science, you don't have what's being built on top of it. And then the next level is the whole cultural, science, scientific, academic debate, and then beyond that, it's the theological implications. Uh, so, uh, so I see that see them all working together, but there's not a tight logic that gets you uh, from intelligent design to theism. So, I think this next question is kind of a natural follow up. This is submitted anonymous, anonymously. For those who are persuaded of intelligent design and yet remain non-theists, what sorts of ways do they? explain the intelligent origins? Well, I, I think I uh, gave the example of the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. So I think, you know, and I think just in general, some sort of teleology built into the world. Uh, Tom, Thomas Nagel, uh, philosopher at NYU, I mean, he is uh, going to be, uh, he very much liked Stephen Meyer's book, Signature in the Cell. Uh, he took a lot of flack for that. Uh, but he sees there being a naturalistic teleology in the world. So he's not uh, a materialist, uh, but uh, but on the other hand, he's not a theist. You know, in fact, I think he's he's been outspoken that uh, he really doesn't want a uh, Christian like God to exist. You know, so there's uh, I think if you've got I mean the the logic of Darwinism is you know. If Darwinism is right, then there is no evidence for for design in the world. So uh, if you run the logic, if there is evidence for design in the world, then Darwinism is wrong, you know, and the, and the sort of materialism that goes along for the ride is wrong. But what are the options beyond that? Well, I think there, there are many religious options and there there are some teleological options, you know. So I think uh, so. I think your intelligent design is going to tell you that there's some real teleology, you know, that uh, that intelligence is in some ways fundamental behind the world. Because the alternative is that there's no, you know, the world starts without any intelligence, and then intelligence somehow emerges. And how does it emerge? Well, uh, you know, natural selection is tends to be the the most obvious candidate for trying to explain that. A couple of questions here about um, 
Oh, sorry. I just lost my place again. Um, yeah, about some of the terms being used in the book. So, for example, um, you, you talk about prob probabilistic resources a lot, but that's not a term that a lot of people are used to using or that they learned in their college statistics class. So um, one of the questions from Tom Sewer is, I think most people had practical statistics courses based on normal di distribution. And so would it be useful to explain extremely small probability events in terms of standard deviations of 100 or 150 for those with that kind of a education? Winston, do you want to jump in? I've been talking quite a bit. Um, yeah, so I could see how certainly people who remember their statistics classes could find it useful to think in terms of uh, standard deviations and such. Uh, it can be a little tricky because not everything is a normal distribution, and so not everything actually fits into a standard deviation thing because if like if you're considering like how unlikely is a naturalistic origin of life um yeah I, it doesn't even compute to try and think of what 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 would even a standard deviation mean in that context uh so the standard deviation thing is not really general enough to handle the kind of probabilistic questions we're dealing with okay that's helpful you know, let, let me just jump in. I mean, you know, the probabilistic resources is a term of use, and I think I introduced it. Uh, but it's 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 not as though this just floated in from nowhere. I mean, we we all have uh, good senses about what probabilistic resources look like. For instance, I mean, why do we have credit cards with sixteen digits plus an expiration plus a CVV? Well, it's to re prevent people from just randomly generating numbers and getting a usable credit card, you know? So, and if we had not just billions of people, but billion, billion, billion people on the world, uh, then if people were randomly generating credit card numbers, uh, they would occasionally come up with a an actual functional credit card. So, so these ideas of probabilistic resources, I mean, we use them all the time. I mean, it's uh, we we ask just you know they they gauge how probable things are. Uh, just the security, cybersecurity depends on how many brute force attacks are possible. You know, that's a probabilistic resource question. It turns out, I mean, this is an argument we make in the book that probabilistic resources and computational resources end up actually being, in many cases, equivalent. So it's uh, so just, uh, you know, I, I would say it would be nice to see uh, standard statistical theory embrace these ideas, you know, because I, I think it, it would actually enrich the subject. Uh, Mark Rogers asked the question, the, the DNA molecule itself holds an incredible amount of information. It is common among all species, yet gives rise to high diversity, even with just four bits. Does the DNA itself infer design? Uh, I mean, it, does it imply design? Uh, you know, I think... One thing which you have, I mean, DNA just uh, isn't just uh, residing there alone. It sits in an entire system for protein creation, and you've got a code. I mean, a code is not just a sequence, uh, a bunch of letter sequences. It's a method of transformation from one symbol convention to another. So you think of your uh, orphan Annie decoder ring, you know, where you've got, you know, letters of the alphabet, maybe numbers. Uh, uh, so in this case, you've got a system that takes you from triplet codons to amino acids. Uh, and where do you get a code? You know, I mean, I, I think it's, it's remarkable that the theory of this sort of coding of information is uh, done mathematically by Claude Shannon in the late 1940s. And then uh, I think 1948-49 is when he publishes. And uh, a few years later, 1953, Watson and Crick lay out the structure of the, the double helix. And then within eight years, uh, they've cracked the DNA code. You know, where do you where do you get a code? You know, and that code is absolutely essential for life. You know, so how do you evolve something like that? I mean, uh, we don't know of any simpler codes. People talk sometimes about uh, maybe there were doublet codons instead of trip, triplets. Uh, but that's pure speculation. We have no evidence for anything like that. So, uh, so where do you get that? But uh, uh, 
you know, so I think these are very strong considerations uh, for, you know, why there's design there. Uh, you know, I, I think part of the problem is that, you know, I'm not even sure, you know, how do you assign an improbability to the emergence of a code? You know, I mean, codes, all, all the codes that we know are created by individuals. You know, I mean, I guess you could swish around, uh, go to a chemical supply company and get uh, some basic uh, nucleotides and start swishing them around and seeing, you know, do I get a uh, genetic code out of that? Uh, good luck with that. You know, I don't think you're going to be seeing anything that's biologically interesting or functional. I think part of the question um, was just about the, the information compression value of DNA and the size of, of this storage mechanism. There's another related question that says one gram of DNA can hold up to about 215 petabytes of information. Has technology, I'm assuming he's saying human technology, been able to match these values? If not, then wouldn't this be enough of an argument to imply the need of a designer? Um, I think in terms of information density, uh, we can do better than DNA. I mean, DNA is incredible, but uh, I think um, uh, I think IBM, there's, I think, a zirconium uh, molecules, which they they etched and you know i think it was at a much smaller scale than dna so you can you know potentially uh i think you can get you can get better densities i, I wrote a paper on this years ago for a website just on in terms of information density but it's super impressive also these are uh, mechanical chemical systems not electronic systems so you've got to spool unspool the dna i mean there's all sorts of you know accessing it keeping it from you know uh, jamming up as as a uh, fishing line would jam up you know so there's uh, so yeah I, I think to to the point about you know just the density though and you know just as an impressive technology for storing information I'd say yeah it's jaw dropping but uh, you know often you know the question then still is where's the design inference there how do you assess the probabilities and for the Darwinist you know all these amazing properties leave them unimpressed it's still you know isn't it amazing what natural selection and random variation can do you know i mean it's uh there's this kind of mindless acceptance uh that this mechanism can do all the the great design work and there's there's no evidence that it has that creative power and yet uh people are in the thrall of this uh, i would call it an ideology there, there are a few questions also about um, the mechanism of design. I know this is a very common question that comes up. Um, and so Jeremy, for example, asks, one large critique of ID theory seems to be the question of mechanism. So if information is the medium, what do most ID theorists believe the mechanism is that the designer used? Uh if you're talking mechanism as in the sense of how do you get the information into the system, um, you know, I'm not sure there is a mechanism or that there needs to be a mechanism. I think, you know, it's uh, our, our humans mechanisms. Uh, you know, I, certainly if you talk to Ray Kurzweil, yeah, we're, we're just computing machines, but uh, it's, uh, it's not at all clear. You know, I mean, organisms, there's, there's a huge difference between organisms and, and machines. Uh, so, you know, even if at the end of the day, we don't have a mechanism for how the design gets into something, we can still see that it is designed. Uh, you know, I may not know how some uh, configuration of marbles or whatever took that shape. Uh, maybe it happened but miraculously. And yet, if I look at a certain configuration, which spells out, welcome to the Discovery Institute webinar, I'm going to have to infer that there was design behind that. So, uh, so I mean, the mechanism question is is interesting, but often also with the mechanism, uh, even if you have a mechanism, uh, there's often an information problem that goes back further than the mechanism. I mean, think of, for instance, you have a, an embossed sign, Eat at Joe's, that falls into the snow. Okay, and now you've got Edith Joe's mirror image in the snow. How did that information get there? There's design there, but it got there through a mechanism, you know, where there was a snowstorm and the, the sign fell over. Okay, so that wasn't by design, and yet the sign itself was designed. 
but maybe there was an automated factory that produced it, you know? So in a sense, there was a necessity there, but that automated factory had, you know, CAD CAM technology that was, you know, so at some point you do get back to an ultimate design and information source, but just where, you know, what were all the mechanisms involved and whatnot? Uh, often we don't know, and I don't think we need to know, you know, it's, we can tell that that snow imprint was designed at some level, there was design there, uh, even though there are natural forces involved and other things. I feel I'm talking too much. Winston, why don't you <laughs> jump in and, and say I some mean, things? I think it's worth noting that every scientific theory actually invokes things that we don't have mechanisms for. I mean, Newton famously got asked, like, you know, what's causing gravity, this this theory you've got? And he's like, I think something like I finger no hypothesis. I don't I I have no idea. Uh if you go to Today, we have Einsteinian relativity replacing it, but what causes massive objects to warp space-time? Uh, I don't think we have any idea for that either. And I think, you know, every theory, if you dig down deep enough, you eventually come, I don't have a mechanism for that. That's that. This is true of every scientific theory, that we can see patterns, we can draw conclusions, but ultimately, if you're going to demand, oh, you can't say anything unless you've got some sort of mechanism explaining how that works, well, then you would have no scientific theories. That's a good point. Eric Scott has a question about, um, and I think I know the answer because you didn't name this book the design proof. It's the design inference. He says, the fact that a probability exists allows for its actuality without ensuring eventual manifestation. How relevant are these prob probability statistics when applied to any existing reality? Design can be inferred, but can it really ever be proven? Let me know if you want me to read that again. <laughs> Uh, those were a lot of big words in there. Take it um, away, Winston. Certainly, yes. I think we would say we cannot prove a design in the sense of a mathematical proof for which you grant the premises and you the conclusion must follow. It is a probabilistic inference. We are inferring that this is most likely true. Now, I think the things we infer design for are cases where the probabilities are very, very small. And so we can say it's very, very likely to be true. Uh, of course, someone could decide to sit and insist, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to trust to the improbable event uh, and think it's really improbable rather than do it. And that, that strikes me as a very strange attitude to take, uh, akin to the person who's you know, I'm going to sit out here and hope lightning strikes me because that's a really improbable event. Uh, that's just not how we operate in ordinary life. And I don't think it's how we should operate on evaluating scientific ideas. There are uh, a couple questions here about information compression. And so, for example, one person says, Winston, you mentioned MDL and it occurred to me an MDL for something would have very low compressibility is amount of compressibility a step in the filter where random data is also not very compressible i assume it would only be a step to check comp compressibility so compressibility is effectively equivalent to specification so the more compressible something is the more specified it is that's why we th you think of minimum description length as the most sort of clear way clear precise way to define specification so something that's incompressible in mdl is something that is random uh, and you can't compress randomness. And so that would fall out of the explanatory filter because it's not compressible and thus not specified. Okay, that's helpful. Um, also a couple questions about, um, well, yeah, so Sal Salo Rice says, in my master's dissertation, I've studied a bit on Bayesian epistemology. With regards to those paradigms and statistics, frequentist or Bayesian, does one of them in your view tend to be more favorable for a design inference? From the book, you guys talked about both of them in the chapter explaining specified complexity, and I wonder if Bayesian epistemology would make the design inference easier to understand. Winston, you you go with it. You you, you broaden <laughs> um, my perspective on all of this. So I feel like the what is going to be easier to understand is actually going to be largely a virtue of what you're familiar with. Uh, so obviously, if you're already Bayesian in your mindset, uh, then you're going to find Bayesian the most convincing. Uh, if you're used to thinking in Fisherian terms and you find Bayesian kind of weird, then of course you're going to be more 
compelled by a fisherian approach. Uh, as it is, I think that Bayesian epistemology is sort of the big player in the field. Uh, I think even the critics of Bayesianism basically have to admit there isn't really another well-developed alternative to Bayesian epistemology. Uh, so I'm inclined to be favorable to Bayesian epistemology just because it has fairly wide acceptance, and I think it's a very useful way to approach the problems. Uh, I think it doesn't really matter if you accept Bayesianism or a Fisherian approach. They're both going to drive you to the same conclusion with regards to the design inference. Um, but I think I would myself favor a Bayesian one, but I don't know that it's any stronger really in one paradigm or the other. Okay. Well, we are officially at 6.30 here Pacific time, and unfortunately, we didn't get through all the questions. There are actually dozens more um, <laughs> and a lot of great questions. So I appreciate everyone taking the time to submit these. I'm sorry we didn't get through all of them. Um, I will say that uh, if you haven't read the book, hopefully that will uh, answer some of your questions. I know a lot of these questions are about what is and isn't covered in the book. So um, you can either look at the table of contents, which is on the Discovery Institute website for this book, or you can order the book and figure it out for yourself. Before we close, I, I want to give both of you a chance to come back up to the surface. You know, we've dived into the weeds on a lot of different <laughs> questions here. And I'd like to give each of you the chance first um, with Winston and then with Bill to just give us what you believe is one key takeaway from this book and and ideally something that's a takeaway for anyone regardless of their um their field yeah i think a key takeaway would be that the design inference is something we inf infer just mundanely in our everyday life it's not a weird idea it's not some sort of strange thing we came up to try and prove our, our weird ideas about the origin of the universe. This is just what we do in ordinary life to differentiate the causes of events. And we're just ex we're just really explicating what is and how people have been intuitively using since people have been around. And we're explicating it and showing it how it applies to biology and other things. And so it's really just this is standard stuff, really, that maybe you haven't thought through or articulated to this level of detail. But that's all the design inference is. That's great. And Bill, what, what would your yeah. one key takeaway be? Yeah, I would say the takeaway from design inference is that it makes this controversy over design and cosmology, origin of life, biology, it puts it on a science versus science basis. So this is not no longer a uh, question of religion versus science, where it's people of faith just think that uh, this materialistic, naturalistic, mechanistic view can't be right, but uh, they don't have any uh, compelling scientific and philosophical reasons for it. I would say what, what uh, design inference and the work of the intelligent design movement in general does is it gives brass tacks to uh, to the, the science that undergirds intelligent design. And I think design, the design inference is, is a very basic part of it because uh, we do need a method for detecting and inferring design. It's not just enough to say, gee, that sure looks designed to me. You know, well, what is it that allows us to do science with design? And I think that's this this book lays it out and it makes the these controversies a science versus science controversy. Well said. Well, thank you both. We, we've had a lot of people just commenting and saying thank you for your time, for answering their questions, and, and thank you for just this contribution to the ID literature, this next step in the movement, really solidifying some of these key ideas. Um, before we close, I want to let everyone know again that the book is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, bookshop.org. A couple other things I wanted to mention. Number one is that if you have read the book or if you've learned a lot from this webinar about the book and um, you'd like to leave a review, then you can do so on Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble, and that really will help the book to get as much exposure as possible. And again, I just appreciate all of you for joining and having such a great turnout tonight. And thank you, Winston and Bill, for, for taking so much time with us. Good, thank yeah, you. thank you for having us on. It was great. And I hope everyone enjoyed the seminar. Yeah, I sure did. Thank you. Okay. All right. Have a great night.